Welcome to the shop. Well, it's been a long time since I've made a machining video, and I thought I'd uh, continue the process here of making this sculpture, the, uh, the piece of glass, the glass hexagon marine, came out pretty good. Wasn't perfect. Uh, there was a few things about it that I'd like to do better next time, but that's the way it always is. So I'm over here at the mini mill, and I'm going to be making the pieces for the sculpture base out of aluminum, and I'm going to be using the mini mill and the bridge port uh, wherever it makes sense. In some cases, I've gotten so fast at programming the mini mill that I can uh, get the job done in a short time, especially when there's tool changes involved. Um, the bridge port, of course, has uh, a power drawbar, but it's still manual tool change, and every tool would ha every tool uh, length would have to be calibrated. So, for some of the operations where I care about uh, measured tool length and automatic tool change, I do those on the mini mill. And then there's a couple other operations where uh, fixturing it and I don't really have the right cutter set up in the Cat 40s, and it's a bit of a thing that I do by eye, and it feels a little safer to do it on the bridge port, and so I do it on the bridge port. So I'm going to start out here uh, showing how I use the, the Haas probing system. For those who aren't familiar with uh, CNC machining, the, the vices can be put pretty much anywhere on the table, and the part can be put pretty much anywhere in the vise, depending on how your jaws are set up. And the machine has to know where the reference zero is. And so in order to measure the location of the reference zero, I'm going to be using these precision ground one, two, three blocks, and these are the special ones without holes in them. And going to put it in place in the vise, the zero reference position is going to be at the left back corner at the ledge surface. I've got uh, custom machined soft jaws with a ledge that I prefer over parallels because the ledge can't possibly get lost. And if you are drilling and you happen to drill a little too far and drill into the soft jaws, it's nowhere near as bad as drilling into parallels. So this is the uh, Haas measurement probe. And I have a probing routine that automatically probes the two sides and the top. Of course, the block is one inch thick, and when I measured it with a precision micrometer, it really is one inch thick, 1.0000. 1 and so in my uh, probing routine, I can do a bit of math and subtract an inch to set my zero point at the ledge. So things should be ready to go here. Let me put on uh, I always use safety glasses in the shop just because safety is a good thing and, you know, it just makes sense. But they're also prescription, and that way I can actually see what I'm doing. So, I'm going to start out here measuring, going carefully down and across. When using the probe, it's really important to uh, not make mistakes in programming because if you uh, get it wrong and command a rapid move uh, somewhere where you shouldn't go, you can destroy the probe and it's a fairly expensive tool. And that's why the routine does a rapid down to a safe distance and then what's called a protected move and a protected move means if it encounters an obstacle along the way, it will stop and flag an error. So I'm also going to be using another work offset. I use lots of work offsets in, in the shop. I'm also going to be using a right hand work offset. 
and be able to see why I'm doing that in a moment, but I don't have a, a combo probing routine set up. So I have to go over to the interface and select it, wrap it down to a safe height, protected move, measurement. The LEDs that are flashing are indicators telling that, yes, the battery is okay, yes, the surface has been found, yes, the probe is happy. It's communicating using wireless communication. I believe it's an optical uh, communication method and it's not a, uh, an RF wireless, but whatever method it uses works really well. So I'm gonna start off here Remove the one, two, three block. Now, just good milling practice. Clamping a part like that, it works, but it's considered somewhat poor practice because it puts a lot of force on this, vi on this side of the vice jaw, causing the vice jaw to kind of tilt a little bit. You can get away with it most of the time, but better practice is to have a balanced clamp so that you're clamping on both sides of the vice jaw or you're clamping a piece that's sufficiently long that it doesn't result in twist. Now, even though I'm gonna be using both sides of uh, both work offsets and machining on both sides of the vise, I'm actually gonna not be machining both of these parts as currently clamped. I'm just using this one to equalize pressure on the vise. I'm gonna machine this one, flip it over, put this one back over here, and then machine the other side. And I do this because I want the uh, machining, it, it, it's all about burr control, it's all about surface finish, it's all about this is gonna be a, a piece of art and not a functional machine part, so I kinda care about the way it looks. So, I'm gonna go over here to the interface, select, and then I've already got the, uh, the tools preloaded in the tool carousel. And as I've said before about the mini mill, when I first got the mini mill, I was somewhat concerned about the, uh, the way the tool carousel worked. It didn't, it didn't really uh, correspond with my practice that I was using on the Tormach. And now that I'm used to it, it's all under control, works perfectly, and I love it. So I'm going to start the program now. Starting with a quarter inch solid carbide. Uh, I think it's a zirconium nitride coated aluminum bit. And it's a three flute carbide cutter that's designed for cutting aluminum. Aluminum tends to like a smaller number of flutes. The traditional flute count for aluminum is two flute, but a three flute gives a little bit better, a, little, a few more cutting edges, and still gives um, a little more stability, a little more mechanical stability than a two flute. So now, I'm peck drilling with an eighth inch milling cutter. And then after I get down, I do a quick little rotate around because the hole that I'm making is ever so slightly bigger than an eighth. And then the tiny little hole is just a drilled hole. So drilling that hole, then back to the quarter inch three flute from Lakeshore Carbide, designed for aluminum, works exceptionally well, and it is doing the pocketing operation. This is the rough operation, and does it pretty quickly. Now, 
Shifting back to the little guy, to the eighth inch, two flute, solid carbide milling cutter. And I'm going slow with this guy. I haven't yet gone through the exercise of seeing how hard I can push it before I break them. And so if this was in production, if I was making hundreds of these guys, I'd probably spend some time optimizing. But this is kind of a one-off art project. And so I'm just taking it slow. Don't want to break that little one-eighth cutter. And now I've got programmed into, programmed into the G-code a pause so I can flip taking the reference zero, flipping it over, reference zero over there, put the spacer back in, clamp it down with the super duper new speed handle that I just got, and then reload the quarter inch end mill and do the reverse side. This is a a reasonably complex little part that has two sides of inner cutouts, one side of profile, and then a variety of other uh, operations like a drill from one side and a slot from another side to make a moderately complex little part. So that would actually be one, two, three, four, five operation part. So very, very, very slowly, probably way too slow, probably doesn't need to go anywhere near that slow, but like I said, better to be slow than to break a cutter. And making the final finish cut the rough cut left a 15 thousandths allowance. Now here comes my favorite new tool. Just recently got this one and very cool. Kind of keeps the machine a tiny bit cleaner. So let me see if I can get over here to the camera if it'll focus on that. That's what the first and second operation looks like. So I'm going to run the rest of them. And then in order to mill the outside perimeter of this guy, I actually need to make a custom fixture. Now, people who have never done machining before and kind of don't understand all of the details of it, may not realize that you can't just, you can't always make every part with just vice jaws. Many, many cases. I have a rack full of fixtures that I use for making the Inqualla and the squeezer, and this project is no different. I'm going to have to make a custom fixture, at least one, probably three custom fixtures that will hold the pieces in place as the outside is being milled. I typically mill the inside first and then put it on the fixture and mill the outside. So anyway, that's all for right now. Turn the camera back on for the next operation. Okay, the first and second operations are complete. Now it's time to make a fixture. This little fixture is a, a slightly tricky fixture because it has to fit fairly carefully. Uh, when I'm making the just ordinary mechanical parts, I'm a little bit less concerned about the appearance. Uh, and so screwing things down with a screw is no problem. It doesn't bother me if the screw leaves a tiny little scar on the surface. But since this is a, a somewhat artsy fartsy piece, uh, I'm making a fixture that has a protruding part that fits the inside that I just milled, and it fits really accurately. So I'm taking the exact same tool path, the same CAD drawing outline that I used to cut the, uh, the pocket, the recess, and using that to cut 
a protruding island. Um, I'm, in the CAD program, I configured it to give me two thousandths of an inch clearance, and I've found that that gives a nice fit. I don't want to have to pound these guys on and then pry them off. I want to have a nice, close hand fit that'll make the part look good when it's done, but not be too insanely difficult to remove. So I haven't set up the tools yet, and this gives a good opportunity to show how I do my tool changes. Uh, I have uh, done some programming and made a custom post processor for the machine using uh, Bobcad uh, scripting language. And so I put an option stop in every time there's a tool change, and then I can open the door and uh, grab the tool that I need, being very careful to look at, I have the the number of the tool with a Dymo label on the tool holder. I can also look at the user interface screen to make absolutely sure that I've got the right tool. Um, this is the problem that I kind of talked about a little bit before, where in the Haas Mini Mill, the, the carousel, the uh, what they call the umbrella tool carousel, has 20 positions, and they assume that you're going to have tool one in position one, two, three, four, etc. I have like almost 60 tools, and 20 tool holder is not going to be sufficient for me. And I like to have, because the, the tool change is pretty slow, I like to have them sequenced in the order that they're used. And so the order might be, you know, tool 15, 27, 3. And so I could never have the number in the tool holder equal the number of the tool that corresponds to its length offset in the offset table. So I wrote a custom program, figured it out, works perfectly. So here we go. Let me uh, come over here and now this is going to be the first time that I'm running this. I'm only making one. It's a one-off. And so I'm going to go a little bit on the slow side, a little bit on the careful side, do my standard procedure when doing a new part. So I'm going to slow the rapid, put it in single block. The toolpath program puts in a rapid to an inch above the surface, and so when I'm running in single step, it gives me a little bit of kind of uh, uh, cross-checking, idiot checking to see, oh yeah, that, that doesn't look like a problem. And then that looks like it's going to be fine, so... Okay, and then the next tool, I'm going to be drilling and tapping a hole. Check the tool number, check the tool number, double check, cross check, check it again, check the check. And I think I'll just let this one run. I'm confident that it will be happy. And there we go, poked a little hole. And the mini mill supports rigid tapping, which is a really great thing. Tool 34, tool 34, check, double check. 
looking good and everything looks reasonable and there we go I didn't program a blow cycle on this since I'm only doing one so now the moment of truth and yes that is a beautiful fit there's no side to side wiggle everything fits great looking good so now I'm going to go back into the CAD room and program the profile and be back in a couple of minutes. Okay, I've got the outer profile programmed and I'm ready to go. This will be the first time I run it, so I'm going to be a tiny bit careful, although I've done this so many times that it's a whole lot te less terrifying now than it was the first time I did it. But then again, you know, when, when doing... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> when doing three axis milling on a high performance, high speed machine like this, as soon as you start getting confident, that's when you make the really big mistakes. So I'm trying to balance confidence that, oh yeah, I've done this a lot of times. Oh yeah, I ran the simulation in the toolpath program. Oh yeah, I'm sure it'll be okay. And then combining that with, yeah, even though you're sure, Take it slow, take it careful, follow the procedure. So I do need to reset my zero because now that I have this little uh, fixture, I need to set the zero at the face of the fixture. And since every fixture is different, I don't have, I don't have a universal automated routine that will work without having to intervene so I'm kind of getting the the prober more or less where it needs to be and then I'm going to look at the I, I put a lot of notes in my uh, G code so I can just be like totally sure that Yes, I'm running the right program. Yes, it's going to be the right work offset. Yes, it's going to be the z-axis. Hopefully, I'm not going to break anything. And there we go. No fun at all to break one of these probe tips. One thing that I will say for people who don't know um, all about these things, the probe body itself is pretty darn expensive. The probe tip, this little white guy here, is a piece of very thin wall ceramic. Maybe you can get a view in the camera. It's a very thin ceramic piece that it, it's really stiff and it doesn't bend and it doesn't affect the measurement, but if you run the probe into something, it's a sacrificial part. The little white guy will shatter and hopefully protect the very expensive probe electronics from destruction. And always a good idea to prevent destruction of expensive things. So I've got a, a screw and a washer with a little bit of plastic tape on it. So I'm going to get this guy in place. And yes, it is a really, really nice, not quite tight, but tight enough fit. And then I'm going to use the screw and the washer just barely touching because since the profile fits so perfectly, the profile is taking most of the load of cutting and the screw doesn't have the screw just keeps it from lifting and so I don't have to like really crank it down and yes this method did work really well on the last one I did so I have confidence that it's going to be fine option stop And I don't 
don't believe I like that. I don't believe I like that. The machine is on the network, and so I can just walk right into the office, which is right next door to the shop, and make a change in the program when I see something I don't like. And there may be one other thing that I need to do. Nope, didn't need to do it. It was already done. So. Tool 48, tool 48. This is the aluminum shredder. I don't know if you can see here on the camera. This is a three flute aluminum roughing cutter from Lakeshore Carbide. And it does a great job of tearing through aluminum. Makes really, really, really small chips. And the nice thing about small chips is the coolant washes them away really easily. Um, when I'm doing production parts, I typically don't do this method. What I'm going to do for this is just kind of like run a profile around the outside, and that results in some kind of odd-shaped waste pieces that just fall off. And it's not always safe because depending on the geometry of the part and the size of the waste piece, sometimes they can get caught in the chip auger, sometimes they can get caught in the cutter and break the cutter and ruin the part. So for all of my production stuff, I basically turn everything into chips. I just use an HSM machining cycle and just kind of use a trochoidal, tro trochoidal tool path and just kind of like peck away like that. But since this is, it's an art project, the pieces that fall off, I've already verified they fall off safely and they don't, they're not big enough that they clog the chip auger and it's more work to do uh, the really elaborate tool path and this will be good enough. So let's give this one a try here. Single block, slow down the rapid. Looks like a sane position. Looks reasonable. Looks completely reasonable. And total success. So now, second tool will be a half inch three flute. Uh, this one actually is from Haas Tooling. I've started buying some stuff from Haas Tooling and seems to work pretty well. Seem to have good prices and good quality. Doing the finish pass. And my new favorite tool, the Haas blower, actually made by Haas. So there we have it and the little guy is looking really good. Let me see if I can get it on the camera there. Kind of weird the lighting in the shop is not as good as I'd like it, but there's the part. Got five more to run. Then there's uh, two more operations on these little parts. Two more parts to make out of metal. One more part to make out of wood. 
And boy, there sure is a lot of work in one of these sculptures. So anyway, I'm going to turn the camera off. And then I, when I get set up for the next operation, start up again. So see you later. Now that the mini mill operations have been completed, it's time to move over to the bridge port. I'll grab the little parts here. Because of the way that I'm going to be mounting the glass hexagon, I need to cut a little slot, kind of like in the side of the part right here. And I looked at doing it with an eighth inch milling cutter, but because of the geometries involved, I didn't quite have a tool holder that could actually make it into the area without having an interference. So I'm going to be using the tools I have, which is an eighth inch slitting saw. And then I modified the fixture. Actually, I designed the fixture with this in mind when I first designed it. I needed to put a little relief on the side because it's only a four inch slitting saw. And then I can stick the the part into the fixture, then put it over on the bridge port in the vise, and I've got the I've got the DRO set up and I've got everything all planned in advance here, so I cut the slot precisely. I put uh, uh, layout fluid on it and then scribed lines with a height gauge. It doesn't need to be within a thousandth and so close enough is good enough and a scribed line will be fine. The piece of glass that I'm going to be putting in is 160 thousandths which is very close to the target dimension that I was shooting for. When I make these glass pieces, I start out with a 250 thousandths uh, saw cut blank, and then they're pressed together, fused together on the ceramic plate and squeezed and mushed around. And this, this results in, I try to make them as flat as I can, but it results in a surface that is not perfectly flat, somewhat uneven, and has been a little bit degraded by the process of chip stack assembly. So when I take them out to the cold working shop, I have plenty of material to grind away for a final target size of 150 thousandths. When I measure the piece that I made, it's anywhere from 155 to 160. So, hey, for glass work, you know, within 10 is fine for me. So. I've got this thing all set up and now got to avoid running into the camera because I've got the camera set up here. Going to give it just a drop of uh, tap magic for aluminum. Uh, it, it's a, a good cutting fluid that happens to work well for this situation. And then very carefully by hand. got the, the DRO set so I know where my zero is, so I'm dialing in on the DRO. Yes, I know it would be a lot faster if I set it up on the mini mill, but I don't have a four inch slitting saw set up and hey, I'm only making six pieces, so efficiency doesn't matter. I just did the, the cutter is only 125 
and the slot that I'm cutting is 160, so I just lowered it down. I'm using the, the depth stop on the, the bridge port and the DRO for the upper limit, the depth stop for the lower limit, so now I'm at the low limit. Dialing in on the DRO, and yes, I could absolutely write a little program to do this, but, you know, there's always a trade-off. Like, is it really worth it to automate something that can be done easily by hand? So. There, see if you can see it on the camera, there is the little slot where the little piece of glass is going to fit in. And by eyeballic examination, it looks absolutely perfect. And so, I'm gonna go ahead and run the rest of them. And then one operation remains, which I will be able to do using the same fixture to hold it in place, because like I said, the fixture was designed to do all of the operations, the outer profile, the little slot, and then the mounting hole in the bottom. So mounting hole coming next. I'm gonna turn off the camera, run the parts, and then set up for the next operation. So the slots are cut, everything went well, they all look really good. And I thought I'd take a minute to talk a little bit about philosophy, as I often do. Um, you know, I, I call this an art project, but I'm making it using CAD and CNC machines. How can a, something made on a CNC machine be art? Well, I think the photographers answered that question a long time ago. Artists can use tools. Every artist uses tools. A glass worker uses torches. Uh, a painter uses a brush. A CNC machine is just a tool. So I'm gonna call it art. It has no function. The only function is to look cool. It's the creative work of a human mind. It wasn't designed by a robot. And so, yeah. I'm gonna call it art. And if you don't like it, you can call it something else. So next thing I'm gonna do over here, I'm gonna be drilling the mounting hole in the end right there. And it's gonna be a pretty small little hole. It's gonna be a 256 screw. And for those who aren't familiar with uh, common screw threads, a 256 screw is a really little screw. And you also, for people who aren't familiar with machining and working with screw threads, one might imagine that, oh, a little one, that must be really, really hard to work with. And the truth is, the little ones are actually really not that bad at all. They're not that difficult to deal with. The worst screw thread of the small sizes that has ever existed is the 632. There's something about the geometry where the, the threads are kind of coarse and the diameter is kind of small. And I think pretty much every machinist will have a horror story about breaking off a tap, trying to tap a 632 hole. So anyway, gonna be drilling some number 50 holes for 256 screws in the end of the part. And the first thing that I need to do since I've kind of lost my reference zero, I need to relocate the zero. And unlike the, the mini mill, where the process is completely automated, let me turn the, the indicator around more facing the camera. On the bridge port, I use a a very nice tool, a German tool made by the Heimer Company that allows me to very precisely let the machine know where zero is. And it's actually so fast 
It's almost as fast and easy as the, the very elaborate and expensive tool on the mini mill. So now I've engaged the servos. I'm going to do a quick manual check just to kind of manual check to see, yes, in fact, that is zero, commanding it to go to zero and observing that, yep, sure enough, looks like zero to me. So, I don't use drill chucks on the bridge port. I do everything in collets. I have a, a fairly extensive set of collets and so I can grab most every one of my drill bits in a collet, and that guy feels secure. And number 50 is a pretty tiny little drill. So I don't have a program for this. I'm just going to type in the numbers. So and then I'm checking on the screen, checking, cross-checking, and yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's worth, and I'm going to do one more thing here. I'm going to turn off the, no, I actually don't have to turn off the servo. I'm just going to go to manual jog, move forward a little, and set my depth stop, my manual depth, depth stop. The, uh, the bridge port does not have a CNC Z-axis. It's a manual Z-axis, which actually makes things fairly convenient for a lot of one-off prototypes. So I'm going to recover my Y, my Y measurement. Okay, I just set the depth stop because it, I, I this actually isn't a super critical depth, and I probably could do it by eye, but hey, I don't want to have the drill bit emerging into the pattern. And uh, anyway, just a drop of the Tap Magic cutting fluid. Look at do a quick eyeball inspection, and yes, it looks correct, it looks sane. Tiny, tiny little drill bit. I can't feel anything. The drill is so small that I have to just use my experience to judge the pecking on a on a larger drill bit, you can actually feel how the drill is working to avoid breakage. But on these little tiny guys, I just have to go based on experience. So, hey, it's a hole. Next step is to tap that guy and I'm not going to show the tapping. You can probably imagine how it goes. I'm just going to be tapping by hand with a, with a tap wrench, a uh, tap handle, I should say. So I think I'll end this video here. I've got two more parts to make. I have the, the ring that holds these support arms in place, and then I have the, uh, the kind of the curved support structure that holds the whole thing up and then a wood base that it sits on. So there's more work coming up. Um, it, it's also slightly interesting to, to note that uh, these designs are evolving. This is a variant of the design that I showed um, in the first part of the first video. And I think it came out pretty good, but it, the design is evolving. And this design is actually planned as a component for a much larger and a more elaborate design on down the way. And so the designs continue to evolve. Um, I doubt that I'll ever go into production and make more than one or two of them. Uh, I've never sold one of my sculptures. Um, who knows, maybe someday. 
I don't know what the art market is like. Uh, I know that there's a tremendous lot of work in making one of these things and actually charging a fair price would probably terrify some buyers. But anyway, I'm uh, going to get back to work, turn off the camera, and as always, thank you for watching. It's been fun.